Hello, everyone. Happy Sunday. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs> How is everyone doing? Let us know. Throw a note in the chat where you are in the world, how your weekend's been, how you're getting on. I feel like we've had a lot of really good posts and chatter in the group recently. Um, Shai Esther did this really powerful post about Mother's Day. Um, I don't know if you follow her on social, but she always just has such profound insights. She's incredible. Um, she was sharing how her relationship with her mom was pretty complex. Um, Obviously, you know, her mom was a Holocaust survivor as well as her dad. Um, and they actually met, um, I think it was like in a detention camp right after the, the war wow. and they fled to Belgium. And her mom was a really tough cookie and was kind of pretty um, hard on Esther. Esther said, I needed to get double confidence enough for myself and to quell her anxieties. Oh my gosh. Um, and she was talking about how, um, yeah, like a big kind of inflection point in her own personal growth journey was when she was able to kind of see her mom um, holistically, you know, and be at peace with the, the criticism and kind of holding her to a really high standard and not always like kind of complimenting her and encouraging her, um, but also being able to see kind of what that did for her. Um, and that's like so a stare to be able to kind of like hold these two opposing truths at the same time. Mm. Uh, I think that would be a good segue to later on. We can we can we can talk about how you know what what I'm about, what our community is about is understanding when we're offended by somebody's actions, like in re open relationships, like jealousy, really acknowledging the root of that behavior is in trauma. And for her mother, the Holocaust trauma clearly was a root to her mom's, you know, characteristics. So similarly in open relationships, uh, when I started to understand my partner's root traumas, I became so much more accepting. And, and like you said, just being able to accept that, yeah, this is a struggle to see these behaviors, but it's also understandable that you're having these behaviors. And, you can't just intellectualize your way, you know, with your mom, like stop talking that way, stop acting that way. Same thing with partners because it's a nervous system thing. It's a trauma thing. So mm -hmm. it's all connected that way. Yeah. How has the way that you practice polyamory changed since oh you've become more trauma informed? Oh my God. It's like night and day. Um, I've maybe a couple of years ago, I was introduced to attachment theory um, and it was kind of in the periphery. And it, I was already changing, but it helped me change. But but reading Jessica Fern's book, Poly Secure, was the game changer just a few months ago when it came out. And uh, it really got me to slow down, to stop thinking that it's an it's it's like a, an intellectual thing that my partner just didn't understand free love. But it, it was it was rooted in her trauma, rooted in her history. And now you need to make a decision about that because once you know you're responsible, right? So you can't just be a relationship anarchist anymore. You have to say, you know what? I've got to put on some seat belts. I've got to put on some speed limits. And I actually paused polyamory for the first time in my life for two months, for 60 days, just to, and with no resentment too. That's the best part. Mm -hmm. I really did it because I recognize that it's a, a delicate balance. And I feel so good about that. I feel so um grateful for jessica's work to finally bring polyamory and um attachment theory together in such a concise way yeah it's interesting because your version of jessica fern is a woman tice gibson who i've been studying with pretty intensely for the past year and it's really interesting because her community is very monogamous <laughs> it's funny because i'll post something and there'll be like so much engagement and so much chatter and then i'll post something related to polyamory and like no comments. great kids right that's funny um, but i do i do love her content um and love jessica's as well yeah um 
So, hey everyone, for everyone who's here, happy Sunday, happy Mother's Day. I hope you're having an amazing week so far and weekend. So I'm here with Shai Fishman. Um, I first connected with Shai maybe through Dan McKenzie, I think. I'm not um, sure. And he is the creator and co-founder of Leveled Up Love. Um, Shai, how would you describe Leveled Up Love? Oh gosh. It's evolved so much. Um, we're uh, we're closing in on seven thousand members um, from ninety five countries. Uh, really highly engaged, intelligent community, uh, similar to yours. From 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 all the incredible posts that I see, that I've had a chance to see, um, a lot of really amazing, beautiful minds. I think what differentiates us from a lot of other polyamory groups is what we said earlier is that we are very trauma-informed. This is a safe community for people who are struggling with jealousy. Mm -hmm. uh, where in other communities, if you're jealous, you know, you get judged by, by a lot of people, mm -hmm. not all, but a lot. And I think that's really hard for people who are struggling with non-monogamy to come into a community and ask some really basic questions and then be like, get comments that are like, why are you jealous? If you're jealous, you shouldn't be polyamorous. And our whole thing is no, like, I think you're more polyamorous. This is a new thing. You're more polyamorous if you're jealous, meaning if you're more in touch with your emotions and your attachment system and more aware that stuff's coming up for you, and then you do the work, that is beautiful growth work. And that is conscious polyamory. Whereas in other communities, perhaps, um, there's almost like a detachment from the attachment mm -hmm. system an avoidant, sometimes somewhat avoidant attached style people who are just like kind of numbed out and maybe from trauma, one could argue. Um, and they're so numbed out that they judge other people for feeling jealous. And we're like, no, jealousy. And Jessica Fern says this too, is an indicator. It's, uh, it's letting you know that something is wrong. And sometimes something is really wrong. Like you're not feeling safe or seen or loved in your relationship. You're the person is not spending time with you. And that is like, not jealousy, that's just your core human needs aren't getting met because they're spending half their time suddenly with someone else. And sometimes it's an inside job and it is trauma and it is something that you need to work with, but I call it an any and an Audi. It's an inside and an outside job, not just an inside job as, as some people would argue. So in Leveled Up Love, we really create that safe space. We also don't tolerate any aggressive communication like our number one ethos is you can disagree without being disagreeable. Yeah. And let's have good, intelligent conversations. And if you're going to be mean or unkind, go find another group. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're out. So that's leveled up love. And a little bit more about what we're building out of the community is we're building a worldwide brand. It's become a real life passion of mine. So we've come up with a formula really quick. I don't want to be pitching anything, but we realized that there are five areas for people to go from what we call poly panic to poly security mm -hmm. and, and bliss. Mm -hmm. And five parts are number one is community. Like we talked mm -hmm. about the community that we have. The second part is education. So every month we're going to have three hour immersions mm -hmm. with Jessica Fern, with Derek Hart, with Kamala Devi McClure, with like top minds in relationships and open relationships. I keep wanting you to, you to say Kamala Harris. I'm like, I'm in. Mm -hmm. Come on. <laughs> well, she's there. <laughs> so uh, I call her KD because Kamala Devi is so, such a mouthful. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, like three hour deep dives on emotional attunement, a, a full hour Q&A with Jessica Fern. And then Leah teaches her secure poly toolkit, which has like a gazillion tools. And Leah's your primary partner. And Leah's my primary partner. Yeah. Um, and then the third, third um, area to level up is is trauma. So we're going to offer a 90 minute trauma release exercise class because ultimately you can talk about the theories all day. But if your nervous system isn't starting a healing process, you're really not going to move forward as far as you'd like to go. So we have a trauma release exercise class. And then the fourth piece is we're launching this month also um, conscious poly speed dating salons for people to meet other people who are kind of like cut from the same cloth and like leveled up love. And then the last, once you have all these new partners from our, the dating site that we've launched a partnership with field and with, with this dating salon, 
Now you want to retain these partners, right? You want to keep them happy. So we have a 90 minute uh, Tantra class with live demonstrations of sacred, sacred spot massage, lingam massage, yoni massage, like, you know, like real demonstrations, real instruction. So in these five areas, community education, uh, trauma healing, dating, and then Tantra, I think that we're covering all the basis to help people really thrive in their conscious open relationships. Beautiful. Well done. I know how much heart and love you're putting into this effort. <laughs> oh my God. I'm like 80 hours a week, just trying to find ways to uh, support people and make it uh, affordable, yeah. make it accessible to everyone. So we've got all types of great plans for all these things. Yeah. Um, I often get the question in the group, how do I know if I'm polyamorous? What would you <laughs> say to that? Oh gosh. Well, you have to the best questions. Um, how do I know if I'm polyamorous? How did you know for yourself? Uh, I mean, I always knew that that something when I was married and I was mon a monogamous for gosh, 30 years. And of those 30 years, um, uh, you know, 19 with the same person. So, um, I'd say I always had kind of like a, a discomfort when I saw other people and felt attraction and felt like, Hmm, that sucks. Can't do nothing about that. You know, just be happy with your relationship. And, uh, what it comes down to for me is this, and this is really neat. So Tony Robbins has six core human needs. Mm -hmm. Um, they are, uh, basically the drivers of all of our behaviors. And they are also kind of the measuring sticks of our sense of fulfillment in life. Yeah. If your core human needs aren't getting met, then, um, you're going to be unhappy, even if only one of your core human needs is not mm -hmm. getting met. So when I was married in hindsight, I could see that I was safe and seen and loved those first three core human needs feeling safe. That's emotionally, physically, financially safe. I had that feeling significant is the second core human need. So feeling seen for all the good that you are, um, being respected. I got that. We had a good relationship. Right. And then the third core human need, love and connection. I also had like, we had love, we had connection. We even had a good sex life. So on paper, nothing was wrong. Right. I generally was like, wow, we're like the perfect couple. Mm -hmm. Something was always like uh, bothering me. And I, I even felt, felt some shame and guilt when I'd bring up the idea of open relating later on in our relationship. And it was difficult and I couldn't quite put my finger on it because it, it wasn't sex, I realized later. I didn't just want to have sexual variety. Ironically, after my divorce, because uh, we divorced when I became polyamorous and it didn't work for her yeah. um, as well, she started studying a lot of things. She's like, hey, Shy, check out Tony Robbins, Six Core Human Needs. And I'm like, oh, wow. And then it hit me. Yeah. Like, oh, variety, growth, and service. There were three other core human needs that I wasn't even aware of. Yeah. And in opening up, I've experienced so much variety, um, so much adventure, so much novelty and change in different relationships that th that need became a portal to grow, to mm -hmm. heal, and be in service. Yeah. And now I can, like, in a tangible way, say, that I've grown intellectually, spiritually, emotionally, erotically, professionally. Like I have examples that are real life examples. Yeah. I've healed and I've also been in such deep service to so many people. And now I realize that everybody leads with different needs. Some people just need to feel safe, seen mm -hmm. and loved. Mm -hmm. And other people want a, a one variety and some of them want just sexual variety, but some of them want variety for erotic growth emotional growth, healing, or just to be in service to more people in whatever way that looks like. And now I know my truth is that I want all six of my, I lead with all six needs, but I lean towards variety, growth, and service mm -hmm. more than safety, significance, and love. Yeah. So I think if somebody, instead of asking like monogamy and polyamory are really just relationship strategies, you should start with the needs and then work backwards towards your your strategies right so what are your needs and then if your needs are going to get met by strategy a like monogamy god bless you it's hard to be monogamous but you might 
do really well in monogamy. Yeah. Right? Your partner might not. It's also hard because they might have different needs or polyamory might make more sense. And then when you ask the question, it's so loaded. What is polyamory? What is an open relationship? There are a thousand different variations. So which, yeah. one, which one are you talking about? Right. When people are asking themselves, um, am I polyamorous or not? Well, are you monogamish? Are you like on the non-monogamy spectrum? Are you a swinger? Are you um, polysensual? Are you um, open relationship? Don't ask, don't tell. Are you communal poly? Like there's so many variations. So that's also the, you know, the next question to ask as well. Yeah. Um, it's interesting in your group, actually, there was a question recently that came up that kind of touches on that. And I think it's super important because it kind of hits at my first question to you, which is how do you know if you're polyamorous? And I always encourage people to start with your why. Mm. And there's a great video on the YouTube channel, Open Lifestyle, mm. which is run by um, James Alexander and Rhea. I don't know Rhea's last name. I think she's private about it. Okay. Uh, but they have an amazing video on Know Your Poly Why. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like what you hinted at um, earlier when you said you have to like work backwards. Yeah. Um, and I know for me personally, articulating my poly why was really a turning point because it helped me see, um, obviously this last year has been really funky with polyamory, so I haven't had any partners whatsoever. But even so, I still consider myself polyamory because of the values behind the decision. Um, you know, a, a value of freedom, a value of being able to appreciate someone's qualities mm -hmm. without needing them to be different because they're not 100% meeting my needs and being able to bring energy from one relationship and have it feed other relationships and being appreciative of that. Um, and also what you touched on, which is the growth that comes from talking through what comes up mm -hmm. in polyamory. That's something I super value, probably more than anything that I just shared. Um, and I know I've spoken with you about the challenges of being solo poly and trying to find that because oftentimes I think primary partners tend to reserve that for them, uh, for themselves, like kind of the working through and the processing and kind of like having that sacred container. Um, and if a secondary partner um, is creating friction in the primary relationship, oftentimes it can be challenging for the primary partners to like allow that processing with the secondary partner. Mm -hmm. um, so at any rate, so the, the group question that came up and leveled up love was this. Um, okay. Does anyone have suggestions for resources around compromising and finding common ground on relationship types and structures? when you and your primary partner have different desires about open relating and different security needs and attachment styles. For example, one partner finds unpredictability very dysregulating in a relational context, and the other is attracted to poly because of the spontaneity and the element of the unknown that it can bring. Mm. One person wants time to slowly adjust while the other person likes to dive in and be immersed. <laughs> Do you hear that, Leah? Because <laughs> Leah's comment, that's like literally our situation, right? Yeah. Uh, we both want adventure, but Leah wants it slower and I love spontaneity. And the bottom line is, is like, A, you have to have excellent communication skills when stuff doesn't match because you have to carry the challenges together. You're on team relationship, right? You can't just be like, I'm doing my way and you do your way. I mean, you're not in a relationship. Right. You're in it for yourself. Yeah. So the communication skills are priority number one, and that's what we teach as well. Um, Leah's writing, I thrive in variety when I have a baseline of some predictability. Mm -hmm. So what Leah and I are working on, it's, it's actually an interesting week for us, uh, as I mentioned to you before we went live, is, okay, well, I want adventure, and we have a lot of adventure planned this week, but... Leah wants predictability. So I can give her a container of predictability. Like, for example, we are not going to have sex with people we just met. Mm -hmm. And if she knows we're in that 
container of understanding, it's predictable and everything else is fair game mm -hmm. it, within that box. Yeah. So you just, what you do is if you communicate really well about everybody's observations, meanings, emotions, and needs, mm -hmm. and you have a good blueprint of how to move through those things like we do, um, then the strategies have an, an organic way of coming up because now we have clear, clear understanding what everybody's needs are. Mm -hmm. And then the strategies just naturally flow because we're all, we're both heart forward trying to solve for both of our needs. Yeah. And then how does that pair with all of the other people who are involved in the dynamic? How do you, how do you bring those forth to them? Yeah. I mean, we just uh, communicate with them in the same method that we communicate with each other. We've got a whole method called spark and we teach it and share it with new partners and uh, I mean, all of it has to do with all of life has to do with setting expectations, right? It's not, I always say, it's not what happens to you in life. It's about what expectations were set from the beginning. And if you're, if you're, if you have enough practice and enough, um, uh, awareness, then you, then you know what you want to communicate about with most people mm -hmm. and then you head off bad, you know, expectations, not getting met ahead of time by communicating about, you know, your your boundaries, your desires, your sexual safety needs, your <clears throat> relationship status, you know, your expectations after an experience, like uh, understanding where different partners are at, like all these things get talked about up front yeah. as much as possible, even though it's a little boring and not so spontaneous. I actually love it. I it, live it, it. It pays <laughs> dividends if you just, if you just get it, you know, just move through it, set the expectations, set the containers, and then check in every so often because things change, people change, feelings change. So set set time to really do check-ins very often. Yeah. Do you have any um, favorite questions you like to ask in the early stages of connecting with someone new? Yeah. There's, um, you know, what is your relationship status and how uh, how would our connection impact anybody else in this world? I'd like mm -hmm. to know. Mm -hmm. And what desires do you have? But also what boundaries do you have related to those partners? Um, what are your sexual safety parameters? Like, are you, and what is your COVID parameter too? Mm -hmm. I guess it's another conversation. And then what are your expectations from, from me? Like, is this, um, I created this conscious relationship matrix where, you know, you can actually talk about your sexual spectrum, right? Like everything from cuddling to sensual to oral to intercourse mm -hmm. but then what's interesting is we need more sophisticated language because that's just the sexual spectrum but what about the emotional spectrum what are you expecting from me in terms of like twice a day twice a week twice a month or twice a year because if we can just set those expectations right they might be completely mismatched from what we're used to mm -hmm. like i could be in a, in a connection with someone where we're both cool with once or twice a year. There's no like, oh my God, you got to help me move. If I ever have to move, I'm calling you. No, I'm not that person. But when we see each other, there's a lot of fireworks and we want to really play with those fireworks and run a lot of energy with each other. Yeah. And that's okay too, as long as we explain that I'm I'm a one over here, but I'm a four over here mm -hmm. on, on, yeah. this, on this matrix, right? Yeah. So yeah, we get into that and 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 it's really fun. It's really fun to communicate ahead of time and make things clear. I agree. I think that that's something that polyamorists are actually maybe a step ahead of monogamous in is that clear, direct communication, that yeah. really clear self-awareness. Um, not all, by the not way. all for sure. But not maybe all. they have a little bit of a leading edge in that area because yeah. they have a lot of practice. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And, and the questions up front, I, I find really valuable and also fun as I share. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, okay. So I had mentioned earlier, you had this post that went viral in the group. Actually, I posted it. I don't know if you know this, but it was a letter that you had written mm -hmm. and shared in Leveled Up Love, which mm -hmm. I'm a member of. And then I posted it in our group and it just got a lot of chatter and engagement. And um, it's called A Letter to the Man Who Shares the Woman I Love. Mm -hmm. And I invited you to read it, and you said you would. 
Mm -hmm. um, so would you read the letter? And then I have some questions yeah, for you. I love when you put me on the spot, but let me just <laughs> go for it. Uh, I like spontaneity and variety. Yep. This is proof in the pudding. All right. Uh, a letter to the man who shares the woman I love. Dear brother, I am in joy. I am also scared. First, thank you. She's spoken so highly of you, and this makes me smile. Thank you for showing up in her life in the way that you have. You'll be exchanging eye gazes, sweet energy, laughter, meals, and touch with her. I know this will bring her joy, and her joy is my joy. I know it's hard to believe, but the freedom for her to explore with you is evidence of my unconditional love for her. To me, true love means wishing for my beloved to be fulfilled in every possible way, even if that means fulfillment comes from some emotion with some emotional work for me. You see, we men have existed in a double standard narrative for thousands of years. Men have been mostly respected or at least tolerated for having more than one lover. Women have been slut shamed, punished, and even murdered in some countries for loving more than one. There is a revolution of this narrative taking place and we can join this wave of change together. Brother, you are something I can never be. You are other. You are her novelty, her adventure. You are not me. When she shares her life story with you, the story I know oh so well, she will have the chance to be mirrored back with a new curiosity. And that feels amazing for me to know. To try to take this experience away from her would be to exercise a conditional love, a selfish love. If exploring new love can bring her immense joy, then who am I to interfere? Conventional love is conditional love. It says, I love you except for this one condition. I will not share you for as long as you are with me. So I choose unconventional love, which says, I love you unconditionally. Therefore, your joy is my joy, even if that joy does not come from me. If you are reading this, then you likely have shown up in my life as a true brother too, open-hearted and caring. She wouldn't have it any other way. You honor the roots she and I have intertwined and the commitments we have made to each other. Like us, you've done the work to transcend many of your conditioned insecurities. You've aligned yourself with the idea that our core human needs, certainty, love, significance, variety, growth, and service are served by the idea that we all have the capacity to love more than one if we do so in a conscious way. She is a divine feminine goddess. She is beautiful inside and out. She lights up any room she walks into. Her heart is enormous. She is committed to her own personal growth and to leaving this world better than she found it. She is a woman that I'm sworn to protect, yet one that I do not possess. Despite my patriarchal conditioning, keeping all of her goodness to myself would be a sin. I have chosen the path less traveled in that I honor her freedom to radiate out love and take in love to be seen for all the good that she is by other than just me. This freedom means more mirrors to mirror back, which leads to more growth, more healing, and more service for her to experience. All of this makes me happy to imagine. Still, I am scared. The little boy in me is scared of being abandoned. The high school kid who was dumped by his girlfriend for the star soccer player right before prom. And the man who lost two big loves to other men on this poly road less traveled. This is my wounding. I'm also keenly aware that there are many wounded men out there who have not been able to show up for women in the ways they need to flourish. I am afraid that someone new may upset all the healing work we've done together, or worse, re-wound her. While I don't know you well yet, and only time will tell, I trust that everything will unfold the way it's meant to unfold. I also trust in her judgment. I persist with this love style because it remains my deepest truth. I push forward with the faith 
that there are others out there, hopefully you, who share in our freedom to love more than one for life. Others who no longer wish to exist in a competitive landscape of disposable relationships or a zero-sum game where one's gain is often another's loss. Brother, we are not adversaries, nor are we competing for the heart of this woman. You know this. Her heart belongs to no one but her. This goddess, with her free will, gets to choose how to share her space and her time. If you are ever confused, scared, or not fully expressed, please know that you are in good company. It will always be my intention to uphold a safe container that is full of heart-centered, open, peaceful communication for everyone involved. So I, so I thank you for the joy. I thank you for coming into her and my world. And I ask that we see each other, love each other, and build our brotherhood from our common ground, this beautiful soul. While nothing is expected from you, I do wish to know you, learn from you, and share with you. I look forward to playing together, creating together, and exploring all possibilities in friendship. And thank you for scaring me. Thank you for allowing me to do the work I still need to do. I am human, and I am still shedding the discomforts that we've all been conditioned to carry for many generations. It is my mission to release th these discomforts. And I am grateful to have you and her on this journey with me. Thank you in advance for being patient and for being gentle with me. Treat her well, brother. She is worthy of and will expect nothing but excellent care, high quality love and mindful communication. One benefit of our love style is that no one gets to settle for mediocrity or complacency. We all are motivated to grow each day and show up as the best versions of ourselves. Lastly, please remember this, your joy is also my joy too. Genuinely, love your brother. Wow. Yeah. What came up for you in reading it? I haven't read that. I mean, I wrote that years ago. Yeah. Wow. Thank you for letting me read it. That was really cool. Hopefully I can grab a video from you and then, and then like, that felt, that felt good to read. Yeah. I'm curious what has changed in you and how you practice relating mm -hmm. since you wrote that and what has remained the same mm -hmm. in your truth. I think what's changed is that I'm not as scared as I used to be. In the beginning of our relationship, I fell so deeply in love that I looked for reasons to be offended and, oh, he's not a match for you. He's got a girlfriend. She doesn't know or... He's not telling his wife the whole truth. I don't want you to see him. And, you know, that was that was me being jealous, being scared. And and uh, I, I I did all that under the, the guise of wanting to protect her. Yeah. Right. But I trust her judgment now and I should have trusted her judgment then. But it was a nervous system thing. I was afraid. I was afraid of repeating, you know, those like I mentioned, losing partners to other men. Um, uh, you know, because they weren't perfect. Um, they weren't, they were more monogamous and yeah. my partners went off to be with monogamous men. Yeah. You know, it's like you open up your relationship and you trust that everybody's intentions is to support each other. And then your partners run off to be with a monogamous man and, and it's, it's wounding. It's traumatic, yeah. you know? Um, but this is not that I remind myself that she's in love with me. And ultimately, even if she does run off with another man, I'm also super secure um, and knowing that I have the capacity to love again and that I'll be okay. Uh, even though it'll take me years to get over it, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll be okay. Yeah, it's an interesting point in the more work we do and the more secure we are in ourselves as whole people, the less... Uh, I think your connection, I'm not sure. Can you guys still hear me <laughs> for, for those that, okay. that are, yeah, you froze there for a second. Oh, okay. I was saying that the more work that we do and the more secure we become securely attached, I feel like the more 
really vulnerable we can be in our relationships and even in being vulnerable know at the same time that we can show up for ourselves no matter what happens mm -hmm. and that us trying to control things won't control things anyway yeah that's so true um yeah your face got blurry but now everything's good so just letting you know that uh you were gone for a second but but, but we're good now um so yeah, yeah. Thanks for for le letting me reflect on how much I have changed. Cause you know, now I feel like she could pretty much date anyone and I'm feel secure enough to, that, 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 that I, that I can trust her. Yeah. Um, Leah, feel free to share in the chat what came up for you and hearing that as well. Yeah. Um, okay. So a group member said, after I had posted your words, this sounds amazing and unrealistic for me. <laughs> and they were curious, how were you able to get to this place? Even the 2018 place, like the place you were writing those words in 2018. Um, I wanted to, yeah, I, I mean, maybe when I wrote it, I was, it was also cathartic. I was trying to believe what I was writing. Yeah. I may not have been fully there when I wrote it. Yeah. But I definitely was further along. Um, I wanted to practice what I was preaching. Like I wanted my freedom, but I needed to truly also practice the other side of the polyamory coin, right? Which is the sharing. It's easy to be shared. It's harder to share. Right. So, um, just self-reflection and experience and a real deep belief that love, like my definition of love has, sh has shifted, right? It used to be the kind of love that most people talk about, the Disney kind of love, right? Like a feeling. And yes, there's a feeling of love. I get it. There's that like warm, comforting, like butterflies in your belly kind of feeling. But ultimately I believe now in something a little bit more tangible than an abstract word called love. And what I think is tangible is like when two people come together and they see each other clearly for their, for their core human needs. I know I always talk about these needs mm -hmm. and, and they're like, yeah, I care for you so much that I want you to feel safe, seen, loved, and have the freedom to have the variety of experiences so you can grow and heal and be in service. I love you. And my role here is to help you get your needs met because I care. And then the other partner says, yeah, me too. Ditto everything you just said. And to me, that's love. When two people come together in any, any kind of strategy or formation, monogamous, solo, poly, poly, you name it. And there is that intent that's that's love for me and therefore it's whatever it looks like whatever strategies if your partner wants to date 17 people that's their strategy and you love them and and your need is getting met too mm -hmm. and that's love it's kind of like a uh, symbiotic relationship between 12 i call them jars 12 human needs jars yeah. and you're just dropping marbles in the jars together and coming up with strategies so everybody's needs are getting met all that being, I said all that to say that this letter is about wanting my partner's needs to get met. And to me, that's a, that's love. Interesting. I've never thought of it that way. Yeah. How mm. has attachment theory changed things for you? Hmm. It's such an interesting, um, such a good question. I mean, understanding that your partner may be avoidant or may be preoccupied or may be disorganized sheds so much light on so many relationship conflicts and adds so much clarity that you stop getting as upset as you used to be. And you can empathize. Yeah, and you compromise, but but ultimately, you empathize. exactly, you empathize, uh, or at least are sympathetic. So you're not as charged by their behaviors, 
you're more curious about helping them to tap into the root pain, which isn't you, right? Because then you're able to say, oh, 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 this feels like she's attacking me. This feels yeah. like he's attacking me. But it, let's, let me get curious and see where is it coming from? Ooh, this is her 16 year old. This is his six year old. This is her 10 year old. Like what, how can I help them quickly get to that emotion, emotional root of the problem, right? Depersonalizing it big time. Yeah. I mean, personal depersonalizing it from the moment and, and, and finding the, 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 the history. Cause yeah. it sounds hysterical. Like literally it doesn't make sense to you that they're saying this. It's historical. It's historical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I've had the same experience and I kind of stumbled upon attachment theory. I was exploring working with this coach who ultimately, ultimately wasn't the right fit for me, but I had always thought that I was anxious, preoccupied. And I, I shared, you know, a little bit about my relationship history. And um, the coach said, like, Leah, I really think you're fearful avoidant. <laughs> and I had no idea um, what he was talking about. I, you know, because the book Attached, which I had read, it very much glosses over it. It talks about like avoidant kind of as an umbrella versus like fearful avoidant and dismissive avoidant. Yeah. Um, and so I I started looking into it and I mean, he was spot on. Um, and I had some really um, traumatic experiences in my teenage years with my mom, which, which led to that. Mm. Um, and um, <laughs> one of the reasons that I approached this coach is I had, a pretty tough ghosting experience with um, a guy who's massively dismissive avoidant. And, you know, my dad was a psychologist, like he's like cracked open emotionally. He loves talking about his feelings. Like I had never dated anyone emotionally unavailable until this guy. And it was so confusing because it wasn't at all what I was used to. Hmm. Um, and so um, what was game changing for me is in studying attachment theory, it's probably been about two years that I've been studying it intensely. Yeah. Um, I was able to so like deeply empathize with this guy who ghosted me because he had shared elements of his family history and it just yeah. made so much sense. Mm -hmm. And um, I actually ended up writing him a letter um, last summer and we ended up reconnecting Oh, wow. And just like had a very healing, uh, you know, he, I still don't think he has a clear sense of kind of what's going on in relationship, in his relationships. Mm. Um, you know, he always said, like, I, I don't know why I did it. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot that's still really like stuff, stuff down that he doesn't have clarity on. Mm. But I know that it, he didn't, you know, like some people ghost because, they're assholes, you know, and they just don't want to take accountability. And I knew with him, it was like a major fear response, you know? I mean, I think that even people that we ultimately call assholes because we're hurt are, are operating from some sort of a fear response because, but it, but it's so hard to see because they've, they've detached from their, from their attachment system, right? They've, given up on human beings because they were so abused when they were younger, so abandoned, so mistreated in some way by their caregivers that they've stopped. They became assholes. They became the people that we call assholes. But really, if you if you try hard and it's not easy and you find out what how they were treated and how they were traumatized, even those people right, have a story that hasn't been told. And in that those moments when they were six, seven, eight, nine, ten, they turned off their attachment system and became so independent and they just don't give a fuck anymore. They're just, they just cut themselves off. Yeah. So, and then the, the, the most challenged ones are the, the disorganized ones because they show up with all this love mm -hmm. and this anxious attachment. And then suddenly they ghost, they show all this love and then they ghost because it's like, in their in their upbringing they literally vacillated between somebody who loved them who abused them love you and then abuse you 
And that's why they just are so confused. And that's what they show up in relationships for loving people and then ghosting on them mm -hmm. because it's like they're just repeating the pattern of childhood. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. It's so fascinating, isn't it? Super fascinating. <laughs> it's been a massive game changer for me. Yeah. Um, okay. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to share about your poly pause. Um, there are a couple people whose podcasts I follow who've talked about opening and closing their poly relationship. Yeah. And I'm curious if you can share a little bit about the conversations that led up to the pause and what you think it's done for your primary partnership. Oh, well, I think that, that in our relationship, we, we practiced a kind of poly that, that didn't have too many seatbelts and too many speed limits for a very, very long time. Um, I was such a firm believer in my, in my freedom and it was my like North star, like that meant meeting somebody new and making them a primary partner within a week. Mm -hmm. I just, I wanted to fall in love and I wanted for that to be okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So over the years that, um, behave, those behaviors, those choices, wounded my partner who was preoccupied attached yeah anxious attached and so i shifted to another type of polyamory that is more integrated more communal and kind of like loving the world together with my partner so more getting into triad configurations yeah and that really started to help things a lot because it was no longer v formations where i would leave for periods of yeah so I'm sharing all this history because it leads up to these triad formations. But even within the triad formations, I was moving too fast and I was mm, entering into, into configurations that were sort of primary, like co-primary relationships. And that was scary. And Leah, Leah my partner, hadn't done her healing or proper mm -hmm. healing yet. And so we were, we started taking a look at some therapy, um, you know, for, for her past trauma. And, and I thought, you know what, this is a good time. This literally just came to me out of nowhere. I was like, you know, we've learned so much in the past year, like, but you need, she need, I said this to myself, she needs breathing room. So I, I proposed it to her and I said, I think you need breathing room. And she was like shocked, shocked that I would like put down the poly Bible and <laughs> put everything on pause, like what? And um, it was only supposed to be for a month and ended up lasting for like two months. Yeah. And actually like, we're just starting to reintegrate now. And in the reintegration, um, I'm finding myself, all right, this is another thing where I can slow. Oh, there's another thing I can slow down on. And there's another thing I can slow down on. And I'm just like, you know what? Anybody, anybody that's worth connecting with yeah. is worth slowing down with. If they're yeah. not going to be here, then that's okay. Um, you know, I don't need to rush anything. And that feels good to know. Do you think that there was trauma in that rushing on your end? Trauma for me? Do you think kind of the the why behind the jumping into things um, 100 miles an hour, um, do you think there were elements of your past that were inspiring that? That's a really, you've asked the best questions. Wow. I think that, yes, to some extent, you know, I was dumped, right? So being dumped uh, by someone is always painful. And when you meet someone, you want, and I think a lot of people experience this, when you meet someone, you really want to put your best foot forward and connect in a way that, I don't know if it's trauma, but it might also be, I'm thinking about it as I'm answering, it might also just be plain strategy, right? Mm -hmm. The truth is, is that good, good quality people are hard to find. Somebody that you really match with and vibe with is not easy. And if you meet someone, you know, they're dating other people. So if you're like, 
yeah, this was a great date. I'll reach out to you next month because I'm moving slow. Yeah. It's like, well, the odds of them finding somebody else are pretty high when you do that. Now, if you're like, I want to see you every day, the odds of them putting attention on you become higher. Interesting. And that's just straight like logic. And that's the logic I've been using. But now I've, I think I'm trying to find that sweet, everything is a balance in life. Yeah. That sweet middle of like, all right, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll call, I'll, I'll text them every couple of days. I'll get on a phone call. Mm-hmm. I'll plan another date in a couple of weeks, like something more in between than jumping. Like it's all about trying to find the balance between my needs, my strategies and my partner's needs and her strategies. Yeah. So I don't know that it's trauma because maybe it was, yeah, maybe it was in the past, like a fear of being alone, wanting more connection. You know, there's a lot of that. Yeah. But now that's transformed to just like plain strategy of like, yeah. I've got to find a balance between, you know, dating someone and being like, yeah, I'll call you in three months because I got to move slow. You know, yeah. It's not going to work. That's so interesting. I definitely tend to kind of like what you described. I tend not to feel connection very often. Mm-hmm. And so when I do feel it, um, the that bucket, that needs bucket, Mm. or whether it's like emotional intimacy or physical intimacy or even just like flirty banter it tends to be that needs bucket tends to be like on empty and so i think that's more my why for i i do have a tendency for like things to escalate rather fast i want to ask you a question because i i was debating debating with someone yeah um, and they felt that like if you have, if you meet, like you talk to someone on the phone and then you go on a first date, mm-hmm. like making out with them on a first date is too fast or jumping in bed with them is too fast. Um, kind of, you know, like, I, I wonder if we could take a survey, like how many people, if they're feeling chemistry and their sexual safety and everything's good, would either make out or sleep with someone on a first date versus people who are just like, yeah, um, I need like five dates before I kiss or jump in bed with you, or I need two dates or whatever. Like, I'm curious, like what the average is, not that anything is right, wrong, good or bad, but I certainly feel that everybody's different and there's nothing wrong with like wanting to sleep with someone on a first date that you just, as long as everybody's, you know, consenting adults, right? Yeah, I think it gets back to your why and that chart that you talked about. Like if your why is mainly related to sexual variety Mm -hmm. or sexual connection, like kind of more like a la swinger, then I think it makes a ton of sense. If your why is more related to emotional intimacy, it probably makes less sense. I don't know about that. Not to disagree, I just... I think that I don't I think that if you've got a really good like I don't know if you've been on a date where it's just like it's just a really good date you click on every level and you kind of just want to move energy with someone nope. and and I know that you're different than me. Yeah. And they want to move energy with you too, right? And and then you can still have a really deep emotional relationship after that date. There's no reason why an amazing first date that includes intimacy means that you can't have depth. You have to that. you can actually have depth on that first date and never see that person again either. You can have an incredible, deep, meaningful, awesome first date with sex and never see that person again. Yeah, hundred percent. What did you mean by? I know that personally, I have never desired that. to sleep with someone on a first date. On a first, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but you know other people who have done that. Oh, and, of course. And they and they were they were successful. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't like do it just for swinging or just for the swingy side or just for sex. Um, uh, I'm not that guy. I'm not into having sex with someone just for the physical. But if I'm I'm a sapiosexual, and if I feel like a really deep intellectual and emotional bond with someone, yeah. there's no reason why I need to wait three months. Yeah. So, um, 
Even but, when I felt my like most explosive connections, I yeah, still, away, yeah. 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 And you ever ask yourself why? I think it might get back to attachment theory. Why? Because I, um, I think I need to feel like really safe. Mm, that makes sense for, especially for, I think more for women. Fair. Yeah. Women need to feel safer. Men have less risk in this world. Generally speaking, they I, have, they have risk, but they have less risk physically. I think some women though, it's the opposite. They're drawn to the, the risk and the, um, kind of the, the edge of the, the sex on a first date. I just, I really think it gets back to your, Attachments. your, your needs your childhood experiences. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah. We should run surveys in both of our groups and yeah. their notes. Like, would you yeah. have, would you have sex on a first date ever? Yeah. Even if it's an amazing connection, yes or no. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we could do a poll for sure. Yeah. Um, someone said, I think I'm less discerning once sex is in the picture, which is problematic early on because I don't really know you. Mm. Um, yeah not at all yeah and leah brought up another great point which is if you're familiar with jaya's erotic blueprints um one of the blueprints is energetic which is all about kind of the anticipation mm -hmm. and the teasing and that's one of my erotic blueprints mm -hmm. and so for me it's really enjoyable not to like jump into it Mm -hmm. It's kind of that, that dance leading up to it. Mm -hmm. And so you kind of bypass that in a way. Um, I'm sensual mm -hmm. blueprint. Um, not sure about energetic as much. Um, I have to take a look at the blueprints again, but that would make sense. Like I have, and I also have a driving need to serve, right? Mm -hmm. So often if I'm on a first date, like I just want to be in service because, because there's a lot of people that need love. And, and like, I think that I give good love. Mm -hmm. And even if I get nothing, quote unquote, out of it, you know, in, in the standard sense, mm -hmm. um, I love pleasuring. So in those situations, that's actually my driving need, because I just love it. I love it so much. It leaves mm -hmm. me full after a date, right? I've never thought that ever. I've never thought I just want to give and serve the world. No, you've never <laughs> thought that? <laughs> never crossed your mind? Nope. Um, except you run a group that's in service <laughs> to the world, that right? That's, that's so, a different form of giving pleasure. It's a different form of giving pleasure. <laughs> but, but, you know, I can see how it's hard because not – all men and all women are out there to give. Um, I think that's one of the greatest things about dating um, is showing up to dates to be in service and not to interview someone to see if they're good for you and if they'll get your needs met. I mean, those are the worst dates where you're sitting there interviewing each other. Like, what do you do? What do you like? Da, 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 da. What do you think about this or that? It's just like, what do you need? And how can I be in service to you? Like, how, what advice can I give you? Um, what wisdom can I share that will leave you better than I found you on this date? Like, even if the date doesn't work out to just show up to give a little and, and, and even if it's a bad date, just, just give something, then your dates are not wasteful. Right. I like that. Yeah. So, yeah. This has been a great conversation. My goal with my dates is to have them be as fun as a James Corden late, late show episode. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever watch it? No. I, I just love it so much. <laughs> so he's just so fun and, and playful hmm. in everything he does and creative. I think creativity can be a love language. Like when someone is, when someone um, exerts creativity or shows creativity, um, with you and kind of like brings that to your connection for yeah. sure. That's a love language for me. And humor is as well. Like when mm -hmm. someone is funny in a way that they know I will find funny mm -hmm. in particular. Yeah. Total love language. For sure. There's so many. <laughs> um, amazing. Okay. Shy, tell everyone where they can find you. 
how they can connect. Yeah. So Leveled Up Love is a Facebook community, a Facebook group just like this. And we are accepting members as long as you are cool and um, are into kind communication, compassion, and personal growth. And as I said in the beginning, um, we pride ourselves on not only like making sure that people communicate in healthy ways, but being a community, actually this, the old slogan is sacred sexuality, conscious communication for relationships by design. Hmm. So we're about all of that, you know, building community, teaching communication, um, talking about trauma healing, um, you know, the, the dating aspect, helping people meet each other. We've got like a whole mini community on a dating site, like our own corner on a dating wow. site. For our, for, our, for our members to kind of interact and feel like they're coming into a dating site with their crew, with their yeah. party, right? And then the dating salons are starting. And um, actually leveleduplove.com slash VIP. I just created this weekend. It's a membership program that actually has all those things. Everything I just described, those five pillars uh, to go from poly panic to poly security and bliss. So leveleduplove.com slash VIP. I almost forgot. That's my passion project these days. And um, yeah, I think it's pretty powerful. And I also love getting on the phone with people. So if you want, want to find me through Facebook, um, I'm trying to really get on phone calls and just start open relationship strategy sessions to help people kind of navigate. And I do them for free just so I can learn what people are in need of and so I can build things for people that are useful. Beautiful. And there you have it. Thank you. Um, I don't know if, uh, can I drop it in the chat? Or are you able to drop it in the chat? Yeah. So when we, when we wrap, you can comment yeah. on the thread in the group and share any links or information. Awesome. All right. Thank you. thank you for having me. Yes. Thank you for reading your, your letter. That's I think cool. it will be really impactful um, for people to just hear, you know, your energy and your voice behind it. And thanks for the great questions, everyone. We'll do a poll about sex if you want. In the group. Yeah, we should both do it. Compare notes. This was great. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Thanks to everyone who joined us and for everyone who catches us on the replay. Have an amazing rest of your weekend and we'll catch you in the group soon. Bye everyone. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. Thanks for joining.